What do these two men have in common? Not sure? Okay, I'll tell you. They both won a Nobel Prize. I've been asked a few years. An honor most only dream of achieving in their lifetime. Malia walked in and said, uh, Daddy, you won the Nobel Peace Prize. It's not an easy task. Since 1901, Roughly a thousand people have won an award in chemistry, physics, literature, peace, and economics. But this video isn't about Obama or Einstein, or even Mother Teresa. It's about a man who fooled the entire world into thinking he was a scientific genius and nearly stole the world's most prestigious award. Now, we don't know for sure if he stole a Nobel Prize, because we don't even know if he was nominated. The Nobel Foundation keeps its nominees secret for 50 years after an initial nomination. But there's a good chance this man would have won. Beyond that, there was a good chance this man would have changed the world of physics forever. That man is Jean Hendrik Schoen, the greatest con man in the history of physics. John Hendrik Schoen was born in Germany in August of 1970. He'd spend his early life there and eventually go on to attend the University of Konstanz in the 90s. Located on the German and Swiss border, Konstanz is an incredibly prestigious institute, ranked in Germany's University of Excellence and considered the sole Ivy League college in the country. No doubt a major accomplishment for Schoen to even get in. Even more of an accomplishment to graduate with a PhD, which he did in 1997. Hendrik Schoen's field of study was in physics, and his work would take him to an internship at Bell Labs. We are now coming to the beautiful Bell System Pavilion. Bell Labs is a research and development lab that initially focused on telecommunications, but it quickly evolved beyond that. To date, Bell Labs is accredited with the innovation and development of digital camera sensors, stereo sound, the decibel unit, cell phone towers, solar power technology, and computer programs like C++ and Unix. Although their greatest achievement was probably the development of the transistor, a device used to amplify, regulate, and switch electrical signals. More or less, transistors are microscopic on and off switches that can boost or shut off electrical signals, depending on what you want to do with it. And everything from Wi-Fi, computer chips, cameras, cell phones are powered by them. Basically, everything in technology these days are powered by transistors. Wait, it's all transistors. It always has been. And Bell Labs was behind it all. Employees who have worked for Bell Labs have collectively won nine Nobel Prizes. Nine Nobel Prizes coming from one company is insane. So it's safe to say that working for Bell Labs is one of the most prestigious jobs you can possibly have in the field of science. At the time Schoen was hired in 1997, their latest venture was making the transistor smaller, thereby increasing the number of transistors that could fit on a given device, increasing computing power. Now, this wasn't a new idea. Transistor technology had been getting smaller and more efficient since the 50s. For example, an 8-bit microprocessor chip in the 1970s had an average of 4,500 transistors per chip. By the 90s, a chip of that same size contained over 3 million. By the late 90s, it was getting increasingly difficult to shrink down transistor tech any smaller. Keep in mind that by this time, one single transistor was only 800 nanometers wide. 800 nanometers is 100 times smaller than the width of a human hair. So yeah, transistor technology was already on a micro scale. And by 1997, Bell Labs was having a hard time figuring out how to make it any smaller. Enter John Hendrick Schoen. When he was hired in 1997, Schoen was assigned to a team who were working on organic crystal semiconductors. It's complicated, but more or less, it would potentially allow transistors to be made up of a new crystalline structure rather than conventional silicone, which would make the technology more effective with less material. John Hendrik Schoen, along with two other researchers, Bertram Batlog and Christian Klock, worked tirelessly on this technology to little avail. 
That was until the year 2000, when Schoen discovered a new type of organic crystal that worked perfectly for an organic transistor. It was considered a huge step in the field of transistor technology and superconductivity, and just a huge step in the field of science as a whole. Schoen's discovery landed him a permanent spot at Bell Labs, and his findings led to major notoriety. He began publishing his research to huge publications like Science and Nature, two of the biggest journals in academia. Landing a spot in one of these publications, even once, puts you on the map for the rest of the scientific community. And by his 30s, Schoen had been featured 16 times. Equally impressive was the fact that he managed to publish 63 research papers from 2001 to 2002. His colleagues were both stunned and baffled at how much Schoen had accomplished in such a short period of time. It almost seemed impossible. We're ready, Dr. Spang. Good, we'll start with the negative calibration. What are you working on, Egon? In April of 2000, Schoen claimed to have invented the world's first organic superconductor. Then, in 2000, he claimed to have created the first molecular transistor, the smallest transistor ever created. And with his discoveries came accolades. He continued to be published in Nature and Science, made MIT's list of innovators under 35, and was preparing to receive an offer from the Max Planck Institute of Germany for a research directorship. At the same time, none of his colleagues could even come close to replicating his work or his scientific findings. He was considered nothing short of a genius in his field. He was well on his way to winning a Nobel Prize. In December of 2001, Schoen traveled to Berlin to receive the $50,000 Otto Klum Weber Bank Prize. The man who handed him that novelty oversized check was Horst Stormer, who, at the time, was Bell Labs' most recent Nobel laureate. This is the kind of material that is being used for to make transistors as well as... Stormer won his prize for the discovery of the fractional quantum Hall effect. This is not an integral quantum Hall step. In effect, Hendrik had just recently demonstrated in organics. The parallels between Stormer and Schoen were obvious to anyone following their careers. One German headline about Schoen at the time read, tipped for a Nobel Prize. Stormer is even quoted as telling Schoen, welcome to the club. The writing was on the walls. John Hendrik Schoen was going to win a Nobel Prize. This is where cracks start to appear in the facade. His colleagues eventually began noticing discrepancies in his research. One example is this graph here. This graph was featured in two separate research studies. One published in Nature in October 2001, and one in Science in December 2001. The variables and information on the graph is changed, but the curve is the exact same, down to the smallest detail. This was discovered by two researchers in April of 2002. It was strange. The graphs were in reference to two totally different experiments, yet were identical in the curve results. The discrepancy was circulated to other researchers in the field, one of which was Paul McCune, a researcher at Cornell. McCune then began looking into Schoen's other studies and found more discrepancies. Discrepancies that looked more intentional than accidental. This magnifying glass is making my eye look big. The evidence McCune found made its way to Schoen's other colleagues and to nature and to science, and even to the New York Times, who published an article in May of 2002 about suspicions raised against Schoen and Bell Labs. This would go on to prompt a formal investigation later that month. It was here Schoen's lies would be uncovered. Fuck me! It quickly became obvious that the few discrepancies his colleagues had discovered were just the tip of the iceberg. In reality, nearly everything he published at Bell Labs was a lie. All the promising results Schoen claimed to have discovered were all fabricated. He would start his research with the result he wanted in mind and then alter or straight up fabricate data to support his claim. 
There were massive red flags leading up to the fall of Shone, but somehow they were all completely overlooked. Probably because Shone was extremely charismatic, was friends with all his colleagues, and refused to make enemies. Throughout his entire scientific career, anyone that pushed back on Shone's results or asked questions was met with grace and understanding. Often, Shone would respond by asking that person for help or advice on what to do next. He was considered to be very trustworthy and open to criticisms and revisions. In fact, he was known in the scientific community as the best listener of any experimental physicist in the world. But almost all of his work was a lie. One such example of this was his experiments with aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide served as insulator for the transistors he was claiming to develop. Schoen reported that his utilization of the material yielded charge densities in transistors nearly five times higher than what other labs could achieve. This was incredibly confusing to his colleagues, partially because of the incredible results, but also because Schoen wasn't achieving these results with Bell Labs technology. At the time, he was working in Germany, waiting for his work visa to be approved so he could come back to the US. Suspicious, right? So his work with aluminum oxide was being performed with machines from his old German university. These machines were nowhere near the state-of-the-art technology Bell Labs possessed. And yet, Schoen was receiving results that nobody at Bell Labs could ever come close to. The reason for that was because Schoen never actually conducted any experiments in the first place. All of this was brought to light during an investigation into Schoen and his scientific findings. Among the accusations made against him were nine counts of data substitution, nine counts of unrealistic precision, and six counts of contradictory physics. He was found guilty on 16 of the 24 counts made. Part of the reason Schoen wasn't found guilty on all of the accounts was because the investigation committee didn't have all the evidence to prove he had committed fraud. This was because he kept almost zero written or digital data during his research. Which would make no sense if you were a high-profile scientist conducting real high-profile experiments. What kind of scientist doesn't take any notes about their research? You know. I'm something of a scientist myself. When pressed why he kept no records, Schoen said he ran out of space on his hard drive. I filled up two SD cards already shooting this video. When that happens, you get a new one. Oh, and as for the devices Schoen ran his experiments on? No good. None of them worked. So the investigation couldn't confirm whether or not his results could be verified. He claimed that most of his devices were damaged during transit, or thrown in the trash. How convenient. Less convenient was the impact this investigation had on his career. Following the release of the investigation's results, Schoen was fired from Bell Labs. And following a lengthy legal battle with the University of Konstanz, his PhD and doctorate status was revoked. He was banned by the German Research Council for receiving research funding for the next eight years, and many of his papers were retracted from major publications like Science and Nature. But the aftermath didn't just affect Jean Hendrik Schoen. Colleagues who had trusted Schoen for years fell under scrutiny as well, even though the investigation found that Schoen acted solely in his misconduct. Bell Labs also took a blow to their reputation within the scientific community. Most of the company's employees would end up leaving in the years following. It's important to realize that Schoen's actions didn't just affect him. It changed the scientific community forever. That's what happens when you try to lie your way to a Nobel Prize. Now, this is kind of speculation. Well, actually, it's more like an educated guess. In 2001, everyone in the scientific community and beyond had the same educated guess. Schoen was going to win a Nobel Prize. But we don't know for sure if he would have won the prize because we don't even know if he was nominated. And we won't know for another 28 years at the release of this video, I think. Despite this, it's generally accepted that Schoen came close. All we know for sure is that the case of Jean Hendrik Schoen is a complicated concoction of scandal and fraud. The damage dealt by Schoen to trust in the scientific community still lingers to this day. If there's a lesson to be learned through all this, it's that the truth always comes out, especially in a field dedicated to finding it. His PhD and doctorate status 
was revoked. Damn, imagine going to school for that long just so they could rip it out of your cold, dead hands.